massive models that can understand and generate text that is nearly indistinguishable from human text, and also more massive models that can generate images and art that again is often indistinguishable from real pieces. These are just two of a myriad of impressive feats AI has pulled off in just the past few years. However, even with all these incredible advances, is it possible that the field is still on the wrong path? I mean, how could that be possible, right? AI and the methods we use, they're clearly getting a lot better. Even so, I still hear this topic come up all the time in conversation though, the topic of whether or not we're on the right path. And all the time I hear people saying that they think we're not. And just from this poll I did on this channel alone, you can clearly see, well, not everyone's on the same page on this issue. So what is the issue? Or are these people just overreacting and maybe there's no issue at all? That's what I want to talk about today. Specifically, I want to talk about three points I often hear people bring up when they say that AI is on the wrong path. And I'm going to structure this video Video talking about each of them going probably from the lightest of the takes to more of the spicier stuff towards the end. So if you want to hear some hot takes, do stay around for the end of the video. And just a quick disclaimer before we dive into all this, these are just ideas that are very pervasive among the researchers that I commonly speak to. So it may be different where you are. So if you do want to hear different opinions on these matters or what's going on in the cutting edge of ML and AI work, do consider subscribing to the channel. Just one click, super easy, and it really helps out. With all that out of the way, let's get into reason number one. And this is something I'm inferring from what people usually say. When I'm talking with people about this, they'll usually say, oh yeah, the field is just on the wrong path. People are just following the hype train of what already works well instead of working on the things that are really important. And let's be honest, that is probably true to some extent. People will absolutely work on what is already working and what will get them publications. However, what I've noticed is that there is a large bias that goes unacknowledged in statements like that. And what I'm referring to specifically is the end where they say, people aren't working on what's really important. Because I'm gonna take a gamble and say that if you were to survey 100 researchers in the field and ask them what they think the most important goals in the field are, you're probably not gonna get the same answer from all of them. Now, I will say that one idea will probably stick out as the most common at least, and that would be artificial general intelligence, AGI for short. And it's this idea of having some sort of AI that can essentially do anything a human could do. But we really should acknowledge that not everyone is in the field because they want to pursue AGI. As a matter of fact, depending on who you ask, you'll probably get a lot of different answers as to what people are interested in. Some people are purely just interested in AI for art or image generation. Some people are interested in how they can get the most out of AI for physics simulations. You know, it's a niche thing, but lots of people are into that. And there's a myriad of other things that I could go on about. And even for people that think AGI is the ultimate goal of the field, well, the definition of AGI differs quite a bit from person to person. And heck, I'm even a bit guilty of this myself. When I give the definition of AGI, which is admittedly a soft definition, but I usually say it's an artificial intelligence that can do anything a human could do. But if someone were to present me with an AI that could, you know, play games at the level any human could, and it could read text from the internet and solve problems that show understanding and then watch lectures online and apply that knowledge to discover new things, well, I'd probably be pressed to call that an AGI, even though it doesn't technically meet my definition because unless it had a robot body, it wouldn't be able to pick up objects and move them. And those are all things most humans can do. Getting back to the main point though, essentially what I'm saying is that this difference in goals between different researchers and different people, this is something that is all too often I think overlooked when people are talking about which direction the field should be headed in. Now, you could take this to be somewhat of a cop-out answer. After all, it is really easy to start in a field like AI and machine learning and have this grand goal of artificial general intelligence your head and work really hard on it and then get caught up in something like NLP that has had lots of incredible success. If that person were to have a lot of success in that field, I would imagine if someone were to at that point go and ask them what they think the most important goals and problems in the field are, well, that probably would have a little bit of influence on their answer. I could really see this argument going either way though, so I'll leave the rest of that there for you to decide for yourself on that one. And with that, let's decide for the rest of the video at least that we will assume that the ultimate goal of the field of artificial intelligence is to create a and to be fair, I do think most people in the field have this as an end goal or some sort of ultimate goal, whether or not they think it will be reachable anytime soon. And with that assumption in mind, I want to move straight on to the second issue. And this one does get a little bit spicier, and I'm going to be quite blunt. Lots of these people that say the field's in the wrong direction, well, they don't like supervised learning. And supervised learning, where you're essentially learning to mimic some sort of data, well, that's just where a lot of resources in the field are going right now. And I should be more specific here. It's not really just supervised learning, but rather this idea of biasing our methods towards human 
human-based solutions. So this covers ideas like imitation learning, inverse reinforcement learning, and really just anything else that has some sort of human-centric bias built into the algorithm. The idea being here that by introducing those biases, we're restricting the possibility of what our agents can learn and what they can achieve. There's no reason to believe that we as humans know the best way to do everything after all, right? And for people that really like reinforcement learning, like myself, this is one of the reasons why we really like reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning has this idea where instead of specifying exactly what an agent should be doing, we specify a goal that we want them to achieve, and then we don't impose any restrictions on how they can learn to achieve that goal, meaning that if these agents are crafted and trained correctly long enough, sometimes they can even learn how to do things better than a human could do it because, well, we're not restricting them to ways we do things. And we can see examples of this today. One of the most well-known examples is probably AlphaGo Zero from DeepMind, where they not only created an AI to play this game of Go that could beat world champions at this game, but could go even far above that. As of the time of recording this video, the player with the highest ELO rating in Go has a rating of 3,822, while on the other hand, as of 2017, the best AlphaGo Zero model reached an estimated ELO of nearly 5,000, which is a crazy difference. And this isn't some one-off event, there are several similar examples to this. Another interesting thing to point out is that in theory, supervised learning can actually be formulated as a reinforcement learning problem, and you would do that by giving it reward for mimicking data that you give to the agent. Now, in practice, no one actually does this because it would not work very well. However, the opposite at least cannot be done, right? A reinforcement learning problem cannot be formulated as a supervised learning one. So in really a purely problem-based sense, you could think of supervised learning as almost almost a subset of reinforcement learning, though the methods themselves do of course vary quite a bit. Bringing up this dichotomy though of supervised learning and reinforcement learning might make you think, well, what about other types of learning, right? We still have unsupervised learning and self-supervised learning. And I think a lot of people believe that there's a lot of potential in those two avenues, especially self-supervised learning. Heck, right now, those models I mentioned before, the massive language and the massive vision models that are achieving so many great things, well, those are really only possible because of so many advantages advances in self-supervised learning. Large language models, for example, are often trained in a self-supervised way where you essentially take out a word from a sentence or maybe the last word, and then you have the model predict it. And that would be a self-supervised way of training. And by doing that before training the model on some actual downstream task, researchers have been able to get some pretty incredible results. And actually that exact topic will bring us into the third and last reason I wanna address for why I think some people think that we're on the wrong path. And that is the focus on massive models. The trend started with large language models like GPT-2 that started out with 1.5 billion parameters and then from there grew into GPT-3 with a whopping 175 billion parameters. And now some of the latest models are starting to crack that threshold of 1 trillion parameters. And don't get me wrong, these models are clearly working very well. So why might some people think that they're not the right path? Well, lots of the time, I think that when people make these sorts of claims that focusing on massive models and scaling is not the right way to go, they're usually met with eh, at least lots of skepticism. People saying that, oh, these people are just stuck in the past where they couldn't do these sorts of things things, or maybe because they don't have the compute resources themselves, they're getting salty that they can't get these results. Uh, but in reality, I don't think that many people are holding those opinions. As a matter of fact, all the people that I've talked to that are critical of the current focus on scaling and massive models, none of them actually think that scaling or massive models are a bad thing to do at all. Quite the opposite, actually. Most of them think that scaling is something we should absolutely be testing out and experimenting with. They are usually instead critical of the way this research is done, pointing out that most scaling research being done right now is not so much research as it is engineering feats and trying to beat large benchmarks, which might not actually give us too much insight into how scaling affects these models on a deeper level. That isn't to say, of course, that the engineering feats being pulled off by these companies making these large models isn't impressive because, I mean, it is. There's no way to say it isn't. But it is to say that maybe the research insights that we're getting from these types of scaling experiments are somewhat limited. I personally think that lots of this research, especially recently, has been getting better at this. For example, DeepMind's Go Gopher, this was another massive language model, and it looked into some interesting things and found, for example, that massive language models scale very well, but not for problems like mathematics and logic-based reasoning. Those don't scale as well, and that's a very interesting insight. However, I still do see where lots of these criticisms are coming from, because not all of these projects that take a massive amount of resources, time, effort, not all of them are leading to interesting insights like the one I just mentioned. Anyway, all the opinions I was just talking about are things I have heard personally interacting with people 
so I would take it all with a grain of salt. It's certainly not representative of all the opinions out there. There's no way I could fit all of those into a single video, and there's no way I could talk to all those people. So if you have a different view of this, or you think I'm wrong, or maybe you agree, do comment down below. I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy this, consider subscribing, and I hope to catch you next time.